Refinery. My name is Nikki and this is Lindsay and we are so glad that you're here with us at Refinery Online. I don't know about you, but I've absolutely loved this week of weather. What about you, Lindsay? Oh, it's been fantastic. I had the opportunity to work from home. It was great being able to sit on my couch and work while the rain is coming down and it's cold outside, but I'm nice and warm in my house. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm loving the rain as long as it's from a distance, right? Like exactly. behind my windows. Exactly. My kids have gone nuts with oh. the hail and the thunderstorms and this tornado wind going on. What about yours? Oh, my son has become Mr. Meteorologist. He has tracked every storm and told us every detail about what's going on. It's quite hilarious how us Arizonans don't know how to deal with weather. Exactly. But we are so glad that you're here, that you have joined us online. Um, we want to encourage you to come and be a part of our community. Um, our Refinery Live campus is open for all five of our services. And we just want to let you know that we are doing everything to keep everybody safe mandatory masks, social distancing, and sanitizing throughout our service throughout the weekend. But we are so glad that you have joined us online today. Please enjoy the service, but make sure you stick around till the very end so you can find out all that's happening here at Refinery.
I know what to do when I can't see two feet in front of me when it's too dark and it's too frightening Lord what you've done before you will do it again we believe what you've done before you will do it again in my life in my life Lord and that's why I sing it now Cause even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Come on, church, sing it over your life. Even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop. When I don't see it, when I don't feel it, when I don't know it, Lord. Even when see it, you working even when I don't feel it you working you never stop you never stop working you never stop Jesus you never stop me. even when I don't see it you working even when I don't feel it you working you never stop you never stop working you never stop oh you are the way maker maker the truth and the life anyone who comes to the father has to come through him that means that the way is actually a person and it's Jesus and that's such a great reminder tonight because there's so many obstacles that they come in our way like for instance COVID <laughs> this has been such a hard hard journey right how many times do we have to put on a mask right how many times do we have to do all this stuff and guys that that even affects us tonight I just want to let you know um We've set up protocols and things in place because we want to keep all of us safe. We want Refinery to be open, the church to be open, a way that we can worship God together. But the, with that, we also want to keep one another safe. And so uh, if one of us on staff has been exposed or a potential ex potentially exposed, we, we will quarantine. And that that's happening today for Chad. And he was so excited to be here today, so excited, feeling great. Uh, but there's a potential that he, he may have been exposed. And so he's quarantining. So we're going to see his message tonight in video. And I want to just say, we're not a video venue, venue church. We want to hear from our speakers live, from our pastors live. So this is not normal. But it's just a reminder to me just how there seems to be all these obstacles that just come up. And this is just a very clear one when it comes to the coronavirus. But in our lives, there are things, there are things set in place that are like huge obstacles. Some of us tonight... You may be dealing with some really tough stuff. Your marriage may be really on edge right now. Some of us as parents, we may feel like we're not getting through to our kids or we're losing our kids. Some of us may be struggling financially and wondering what's going to happen. How are we going to make ends meet? And some of us maybe just feel like our, our spiritual lives are on empty. Listen. Jesus is the way. I don't, I don't care what the circumstance, whatever the problem is, Jesus is the way. We have this promise from him. And every time people were struggling and, and wrestling with things, when Jesus was around, he would always tune their, their hearts to, to God and the relationship they would have with him. And by faith, mountains were moved. Do you have mountains that need to be moved? I, I'll tell you, Jesus is that answer. 
Get to know Jesus more than you've ever known. Spend time reading about him, studying him, praying to him, because he is the way. He is the way maker. So can we just pray tonight together? Uh, let's pray for everything happening, everyone in this room, pray for Chad. Can we do that together? Jesus, thank you so much that you are the way maker. Thank you so much that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, that no matter what the obstacle is, whatever thing is set in front of us, you are the path to get through it. Lord, when the people of Israel had their back up against the sea, the Red Sea, you parted that to make a way. That's what you do. So God, may you do that in our lives. God, may whatever that thing is, God, that you would show us the way. And we know that you, Jesus, are that. So God, may you be the way maker in our life. Lord, you made that in our families and in our church. Tonight we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Over the course of the last several weeks, we've been diving into the book of Nehemiah and the principles that I think we've already learned have been nothing short of amazing. And to me, one of the most amazing and confirming things about this entire series is that these things happened over 2,500 years ago, but are so relevant even today. So today what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the fourth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. And we're going to be talking about criticism. Criticism. Hmm. Dr. James Boyce says this, opposition is almost always caused by success and not failure. Nobody would have paid attention to Nehemiah were he failing. Isn't that true? The opposition that Nehemiah faced and is going to face in our text today was criticism. Now, if you've ever been the recipient of criticism, which I'm guessing you have, or you haven't done much in your life, you're going to appreciate what we talk about today. Nehemiah chapter 4 is, detail, is a detailed description on how to handle criticism. I just want to let you know, there was no class in Bible college that prepared me to deal with the criticism that I would come under when I became a lead pastor. I was not prepared for it. I didn't expect it at all. And it came from people who I considered close friends to people who I'd never even met, seen, or been in the same room with. And I got criticized on what I wore, what my wife wore, what my kids wore, where we lived, what cars we had, the way I cut or didn't cut my hair, the way my children acted, the things that my wife did in the church, and the things that she didn't do in the church. It was brutal. And I think the thing that hurt me the most was this was coming from people who claimed to know and love Jesus. But 
Anyone who assumes a position of leadership is going to get criticized. It's going to happen. Anyone who tries to do anything for the kingdom of God, you are going to come up against strict and fierce opposition. Steve Jobs famously said, if you want to make people upset, lead. If you want to make people happy, sell ice cream. Well, I even disagree with that because I think there will be people who complain about what flavors of ice cream you have and the cost of your ice cream. But in this passage, we're going to see some very significant things about criticism and how we, as Christ followers, should respond to it. So we're going to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, and it says this. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring rubble to the stone? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was also at his side, said, What they are building, even a, even a fox climbing upon it would break down their wall of stones. Well, then Nehemiah prays in verse 4, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all that reached half its height, for the people worked with all their hearts. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. So the question comes, what do we do when opposition and criticism come our way? What do you do when you have one of those, I never saw that coming moments? You ever have one of those? Well, we're all having one of those right now with the coronavirus. And you might be surprised that the, of the criticism that's floating around. Hey, you should wear a mask. You shouldn't wear a mask. Get the vaccine. Don't get the vaccine. It's okay to be in public. Don't be in public. And people are polarized over these things. No matter what stance you take or no matter what you do, you will face opposition every time you make a decision. Now, opposition, it takes various forms, as we'll see in these next couple of chapters over the course of the next few weeks. But in these first nine verses of chapter four, it comes in the form of criticism. And what Nehemiah does is he gives us, either knowingly or unknowingly, the characteristics of a critic, and he shows us how to respond to them. First of all, let's talk about the characteristics of a critic. Howard Voss, in his book, he gives seven reasons why people come to oppose success, why people aren't happy to see someone else succeed. Why is that? We might just say, haters going to hate no matter what. But he says this as the seven reasons. First, some people are threatened by another person's success. Maybe their success impedes on your own personal success or plans. The second thing he says is others are jealous, and jealousy is a killer. It will kill everything in your life unless you kill it. The third thing he says is some oppose others or their projects because they just have a different agenda. And that's what it is. Sometimes people just say, that's not my way of doing it. Or if they would have asked me, I would have done it differently. They just have another plan. Number four, some people just feel excluded. They feel ostracized and they criticize and they minimize the work that's being done. Number five, people suspect the motivations of the people that they oppose. Do we really trust these people? Can we really invest in them? And this was part of the reason for the criticism against Nehemiah, as we're going to see in just a few moments. Can he ultimately be successful? Is this something I want to invest in? Number six, some people, especially leaders, lose face when others succeed. They regret sometimes 
other people getting credit instead of themselves. Ronald Reagan famously says this, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he does not mind who gets the credit. Vosless is the seventh and final reason is that it's a spiritual work, is that it could be opposed by Satan. Now, I don't believe that there is a demon behind every rock, but I do believe Satan does try to impede the work of God. And so we have to be weary and we have to be, or excuse me, we have to be leery and critical of those things. Is Satan attacking? So those are some things that some of these people have in common, but let's look at some of the characteristics that Nehemiah lays out about the critics that he's dealing with. First, we come to learn that they are almost always an angry person. In verse 1, it says, Now when Sanballat heard that they were building a wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. He jeered at the Jews. This is one of those moments where if it was a cartoon, you would see the red growing. You would see smoke coming out of his eyes. Studies have shown that people who are angry when they are young are also angry when they're old. It's just not something you grow out of unless you make a choice to do it. Now, we don't know specifically what this man named Sam Ballot was angry about, but my guess is he was profiting somehow by the weakness of Jerusalem. He liked being able to move in and out of the, the city freely. He, he liked having no accountability, no authority, and no structure. Somehow or another, he was profiting from this, whether it being financially or personally. But you know what? It's sad, but there are people like this today in the church. <clears throat> they get frustrated. They get angry when things don't go their way. We've often, often said here at the Refinery Christian Church, hey, if there's something that you don't like here, just be patient. It's probably not going to be around very long. But we also say, if there's something that you really, really like, hey, don't get too attached because it's probably not going to be here very long. But many times, people come into the church and they utter the seven last words of the dying church. And those words are, we've never done it that way before. So we've got to make sure that we're not angry people, that we have our hearts in the right place. A number two characteristic that he shows us here is that they're basically a jealous person. In verse 2, he says, what are those feeble Jews doing? This is a sarcastic remark. He's ridiculing them. He's mocking them. And they couldn't stand the success that these people who they thought were lesser than themselves were having. And they became very, very jealous of that. Sam Ballot was furious and Tobiah joined him in mocking them. In verse 3, critics criticize because you invariably, invariably expose, expose flaws and weaknesses in their own personalities. Number three thing he shows us is that they thrive on intimidation. Critics thrive on intimidation. Critics are always making threats. Sanballat ridiculed the Jews and made sure there was a crowd to hear him. It says this in verse 2, In the presence of his brothers and in the army, he stood up and made a scene he says, we're going to intimidate them. We're going to overtake them. Critics love crowds. They want to make sure that all kinds of people get upset. And they're the ones that use that word they a lot. Oh, they don't like this or those people don't. Well, who are they? Who are those people? They'll never come to a one-on-one -on -one relationship or a facial discussion with people just like Jesus modeled us to do in Matthew chapter 18. When we have a problem with someone, we're to go directly to them. Critics never do that. Most critics are severely insecure, like Sam Ballot, who came with a crowd and made four very foolish statements. Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heap of rubbish and burn ones at that? You see what he's doing? He's mocking and he's trying to intimidate them, saying, your task is too big. You can't do it. Here's a fourth thing that we can learn about critics, is that they run in pairs. Tobias, the Ammonite, was beside him, it says in verse 3. Tobiah chimed in. He said, if a fox goes up on the wall, it's surely going to break it down. 
His statement was ridiculous. But most people never take a close look at the ridiculous statements that critics make. How many of us spend time fact-checking things that we read on social media? They run in pairs. And so typically, when a critic finds an ally, they gang together and they try to move forward together. Number five thing that critics do is they love to prophesy failure. They love to say, oh, I told you so. I saw it coming. Remember what Tobias said? A fox going up on the wall would cause the whole thing to collapse. You know what he had forgotten here? He had forgotten that God was the architect of this project. Critics love to say, it won't work. You can't do that. You'll never find them. You'll never get the resources. It can't be done. They know all the reasons why it can't be done. That's what critics do. Here's one more. They always proceed before they have the facts. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 3, it says this. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was up on his side, said, what, are they, what they are building, even a fox climbing upon it, would break down their wall of stones. Critics always have their mouths open and, are, and their hearts and minds closed. They didn't have a clue what was going on, what was being built under the direction of Almighty God. They weren't interested in knowing all the facts. Critics never are. You can't reason with a critic. And the reason for that is they're unreasonable. You can't meet with them, or you can meet with them, but nothing you say will meet with their approval. They've already made up their mind. They just want to criticize. Now, it's interesting to me that God would include in His Word here this criticism. I think it's important that He showed it here and that it's mentioned here in in chapter 4. And if you study the context of this passage, you will quickly discover that these guys were ungodly men and their criticism, it came from the enemy. So the question is this, how do you, how do we, how do I, as a Christ follower, deal with criticism like that? How do we deal with criticism and critics like that? Well, Nehemiah shows us how. First, He gives us this godly path to dealing with criticism. Nehemiah's responses to the critics were amazing. And he did three very simple, profound, but very courageous things. The first thing he did was he prayed. I don't know if you've noticed this, but that's what Nehemiah began everything we've talked about with. He began with prayer. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it says this, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back to their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Now, it's not surprising that Nehemiah responded the way he did. He always turned to God first. We have a lot of precedent for that. He didn't say a thing to Sanballat and Tobiah. He just started praying. He's like, I'm not even going to deal with these guys. I'm going to deal with with God. You know, most prayers in the Bible are like, Lord, have mercy on them. Lord, forgive them. Lord, spare them. But Nehemiah's prayer was completely different. It was, Lord, zap them, take them out, kill them, hurt them, harm them. Now, we don't know the results of his prayer, and I think that's probably a good thing. But what it did was it diffused Nehemiah's anger. He gave it over to God, and he dismissed the accusations. So the next time that you're criticized or humiliated or intimidated or lied about by some critic, don't get on the phone and give them a piece of your mind. Go to God in prayer. That's what we need to do first. In Romans chapter 12, verse 14 and following, it says this, Bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse. Rejoice those, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, 
Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a great principle here that we need to learn. And this is what Nehemiah is telling us. He says, Lord, I don't need to take this. I can't handle this. Lord, you need to handle them. He didn't say, Lord, let me at them. Give me the strength to defeat my enemies. He said, Lord, you handle this. And that's wise because God can do a better job than you or I ever could at avenging a hurt or a wound. Now, you can end an argument just by being quiet and not saying a word. Proverbs chapter 15, word 15 verse 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath. Nehemiah didn't take them on, on in some verbal battle. He didn't get in an argument with them. He didn't tweet all of his friends about what was going on. He didn't post on social media how he had been wrong. He turned to God in prayer. So our first response should be prayer. Our second response should be persistence. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 6 says this, So we rebuilt the wall till all that reached half its height. For the people worked with all of their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. You know what happened after the criticism began? Nehemiah and the people went back to work. They kept doing the work. They kept doing what God had told them to do. And if there's ever been a time in our lives, in the life of the church, in our lives of the world, that we need to keep doing God's work, it's right now. Now, Scripture tells us here that apparently Sanballat, Tobiah, and the others, they'd, they'd left for a while. So they, they weren't even around when this was happening. They'd heard about this, and they made a plan to come back <clears throat> when they heard about how the wall was progressing so rapidly and so much better than they ever thought. So we need to be people who respond in prayer, but we also need to be people who are specific or persistent. And there's one more thing that we need to respond to criticism by doing. We need to be prepared. Not only did they pray, not only were they persistent, they kept working. They also prepared for the worst by posting a guard. It says, says day and night. They knew the attack was coming and they planned for it. They were prepared for it. You know what? It's not a lack of faith to lock your doors at night. It's not a lack of faith to wear a mask during a pandemic. Some of those things are just smart things to do. It's not a lack of trust in God if you lock your car when you go inside the mall. It's not a lack of trust in God to provide for you when you have an emergency fund set aside. It's wise to do those things. So we need to prepare as if everything depends on us and pray as if everything depends on God, because it does. Everything depends on Him. Now, God's not going to remove us from the tough times, but I can promise you this. He will bring us through, and through His Word, He gives us models of what to look for and how to respond to it. He's the only one that can bring us through this safely, securely, securely, and victoriously, and that's what we're praying for, victory right now. Will you pray with me? God, we just thank you for this example of Scripture. We thank you that the work kept going in the midst of criticism. And God, I know that people that are listening right now, watching, every one of us has dealt with criticism, whether from a parent, a sibling, a coworker, a family member, a friend, a spouse. And those things have hurt. They've hurt us. And some of us are carrying around big wounds because we've been downplayed. We've been minimalized in the past by the words and the actions of others. But God, help us to learn from this story what's going on in their hearts and their minds. That some, so many times they're insecure, they're jealous, they don't understand, they're angry people, and sometimes they just lash out. We know that we're not going to be immune from criticism. And anytime we take a stand in anything, we're going to be criticized. But we thank you for also showing us how to deal with that, to be people of prayer, to be people of persistence, and to be people who are prepared for it and know it's coming. God, I just thank you that your word never 
never dies. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. Thank you for giving us a timeless reminder that we can overcome criticism. Thank you for this man, Nehemiah, and his example. May we have the courage to do it and to live up to it. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed today's service. Coming up February 6th and 7th, we have our missions weekend. Here on campus at Refinery Live, we will have tables set up with all the information needed for our global missions planned in 2021. We encourage you to stop by, grab a packet, speak to someone in regards to all of the opportunities to get involved on one of our trips. And our first deadline is coming up February 7th for our One Mission Mexico trip. I have had the opportunity to go on several of those trips. It is life changing. So make sure you sign up. If you're not able to join us in person, that's okay. You can check out our website on the mission page, find out all the information about our global mission projects. We also want to encourage you to take your next step in faith. Whatever that may be for you, we want to be here to support you and walk with you within that. So please reach out, contact us, let us know how we can help you reach your goals and move closer to Jesus. But whatever you do and wherever you go, don't forget to tell someone about Jesus.